Hi, and welcome to Dare to Dream, yet another amazing episode. This show has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards, as well as a Webby Award, and Dare to Dream is ranked in the top 100 best podcasts in all of USA in self-improvement on Apple Podcasts and ranks in the top 50 in several other countries. Most recently, the Caribbean, we were number one, which is fantastic. So thanks for listening. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for sending this show to your friends and family and for leaving us a great review. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness. They do beautiful energy work out into the world. They teach classes and you can become a facilitator or just enjoy the energy work. Go to Dr. Dane here, H-E-E-R.com or accessconsciousness.com. I'm Debbie Dashinger, and I'm a certified coach. My expertise is visibility and media. I coach people just like you to write a page turner book, take your book to a guaranteed international bestseller, and I pull back the curtain so you have the system to be interviewed on media and podcasts and get massive results. I show you how to find and use media exposure to locate your tribe, fill workshops, sell books, and gain really positive exposure. If you'd like your own set of free tools and templates so you learn how to message yourself correctly out into the world and more, go to debbie-dashinger.com. Today, I've got an amazing guest. She is back for her fifth time. And the question is, do you want to remove blockages in your nervous system and subconscious memory storage? Well, my guest is a returnee. It's Dr. Sue Mortar. She is an energy medicine and bioenergetics pioneer who believes that you're meant to be an active, ever-present steward of this flow of energy called your life. Through her signature Energy Codes teachings, Dr. Sue explains how to combine conscious breathing exercises energy work, and subtle body awareness practices, including her renowned Body Awake Yoga. As a world well-known quantum field visionary, Dr. Sue teaches people to recognize and work with the subconscious or unconscious lower frequency patterns that create relationship issues, emotional stress, physical illness, chronic pain, depression, anxiety, and more. To learn more about all the many amazing things that Dr. Sue Mortar offers, go to her website at drsuemortar.com, and that's M-O-R-T-E-R, drsuemortar.com. And I welcome Dr. Sue Mortar to the Dare to Dream show. Dr. Sue, welcome back to Dare to Dream. It is great to have you for yet another scrumptious conversation, I am sure. Oh, it is my great joy. I absolutely love to be here and to see where we get to go. And I'm sure that we will have a good time no matter where. (laughs) Yeah. You know, so much has changed. I know in your life has changed. It's certainly in my life dramatically, frankly, since we last spoke and in the world. So I want to just start with a global worldview and talk about this period of time, both from the inception January, let's say even till now, and there's more to come, I know, but what for you typifies this period of time? What for your, let's say the wisdom bird's eye view, is this really about on a global level, a collective level and a personal level? Hmm. Well, I have to say that I feel that what's happening in our world right now is the absolute best thing for humanity that could be happening. Mm. We were operating in a pace and in a way and in an orientation that was never going to tap our true potential to be creative, to be innovative, to be present, to pay attention to what has heart and meaning, to understand the value of life and how important it is to be able to connect with one another freely and at will without worry and concern. It's an opportunity for us to realize every moment of the day and recognize how we are operating from fear versus Mm -hmm. how we are deciding that there is something creative and gracious that we could see in every moment if we would choose to look for it. And the way that we were operating as a race, all it's literally a race all across the world, uh, was never going to cultivate that to the degree that we are ultimately capable of and intended when we came here into this life. So I feel that it's right on time. I feel that 
-hmm. consciousness is developing in a way that it is time that we can handle this and on a global scale, uh, a deepening of the heart and an opening of the mind and a greater sense of presence. For me personally, it has definitely been a, uh, an opportunity for me to be so incredibly grateful for the work that I've been in for the last 20 years specifically, but for my whole life, um, being always looking into every situation as what is the gift? What is it that the universe is trying to communicate here? What is the, the cosmic in message? And what is my own soulful evolution to benefit from within the current circumstances? And so I'm so grateful that I've been living my life in the in-between moments that way up until this point and throughout this these moments, the last six months, because because of that disposition, I have flourished in this in all sorts of ways, more intimate relationships and deep caring and a greater presence with with my own um, my own personal pace in life and and really settling in. I've been on airplanes and in airports and in conference rooms and retreat centers um, nonstop for the last decade and a half and the last few years, even more so. Uh, just, I mean, I don't know how it's more than nonstop, but it, had, it was <laughs> all the time. And, um, and it's been really nice to be home and to be settled in and to, uh, and to also know that in an instant, I could shift my, my whole institute from being an in-person live event uh, course offering to a, an online circumstance that is serving more people uh, around the world, being able to bring this work into countries, into villages, into people that mm -hmm. would have had no way of accessing the information the way that we were going about disseminating it. So I'm blessed, I feel blessed, I'm honored, and I'm thankful that it has stirred, you know, our creative juices in another direction. And uh, we're able to, we're able to respond. And I guess in the short answer is, um, I am, I am open and available and observing every moment of ways that the greater good is expressing itself through this circumstance. And because that's what I'm looking for, that's what I'm finding and that's what I'm having. And, uh, and it's been, it's actually been a very, um, grace filled time in my life. That's beautiful. And I've been witness to see your many very fast and fluid adjustments that you've made out in the world very successfully. I love it. And I love that it's actually a win-win for us to still have such access to you maybe more than ever before and for you to have so much more ease in your life. And I'm curious, when you started out, you said you feel like you might typify this, although it is a time of great opportunity and much needed, like right on time, that the main subject was about fear. So when you say that, I can think, okay, fear of others, that's playing out. Anyone we feel is different than us, right? There's a lot of separation. Fear of other worlds, other beings on other worlds and contact. Also fear of change. And I'm wondering what you see, what kind of fear do you see is the one that's really being called to be healed right now. You know, I think, I think just about every human being has gone through the thought process of, as COVID came into the forefront of our focus, you know, what would happen if I, mm -hmm. and what would I do if someone I loved, you know, was, you know, contracted this and, and I lost them? Uh, how can I be of service? Uh, I'm, a, you know, I'm afraid if, you know, some people have spoken to me about their fear of, of leaning in and, and trying to help and be of service because of their own deep fear of contracting something that they cannot, you know, withstand. And uh, it all, all, no matter what we assign the fear to, Debbie, it's about the fear vibration. And however we fill in the blank and the story that we write on top of that is, is our flavor of the month you know it's our it's our particular take on it and the real idea is that i'm wanting people to understand or to Im to integrate is that do i have a tendency to go to fear in these days am i having a tendency to worry and to fret and if someone is walking near me and do <laughs> i do i cringe you know what's happening 
because every single moment that I'm doing that um, in my life, I'm I'm depleting my vitality, my, my vitality. I'm depleting my my own immune system. I'm really enhancing the chances of becoming sick, whether it's with COVID or some other reason. And I'm decreasing the the, the opportunity to spend that moment in my loving and creative self. Hmm. And so therefore I'm not experiencing the true self. I'm in some alternate world that is heady, that's based upon the what ifs and the pontifications that the mental body can generate for us as a life experience. And I also know that the compression that is upon us during these moments is causing that vibration to rise. So if someone is feeling anxious for no reason and they can't figure out what they're afraid of or where it's coming from, I would also love for them to know that that also is perfect and right on time. Mm -hmm. Because what is happening is a squeeze is occurring and what is dissonant energy has to come up and out because it can't be contained when the pressure is on. And so as the pressure is on us, like you may have a job, you may not, you may, you know, you, you, you're definitely home more. There's fewer things that you can go and do to express yourself and to, and to play and to be releasing, you know, pent up energies and to get to know yourself by having those energies be in motion. Less of that is available to us. And so there's a compression that's occurring in the energy field around every human being. And inside of that compression, what is, it's like juicing the orange. You know, you squeeze the orange and ju orange juice comes out and you squeeze a lemon and lemon juice comes out. And if you squeeze the human, who knows what's gonna come out. <laughs> and it has to do with what they've been collecting, what they've been gathering and tucking in there. And so oftentimes what it is that comes out when we juice the human is that, is that unresolvedness. It's that, that circuitry in there that was never hooked up or that got shut down. They, that one stepped around um, these ideas that I'm not enough or these ideas, these illusionary ideas that, that uh, I'm not loved or that I can't make it or that I'm not enough or whatever that might be um, that someone has been outrunning or stuffing down and, and overperforming and, and keeping it you know, hidden. Uh, it cannot and will not remain hidden. It's the nature of coming here. We come here to wake up. What we're awaking up to is what we have not been awake to before. That's what we, why we come back and why we're here. We come to evolve and to realize more and more and more of the truth of who we are, which is made of goodness and made of light and, and made of creative genius, made of creative energy. So if we've been denying that or rejecting it or suppressing it or circumventing the acceptance of our magnificence, then something, some reconciliation has to happen. So this is a perfect set of circumstances for that to occur. It's like if, if anxiousness is coming up every day and you look around and it's like, well, you know, I haven't even left the house for two weeks. Why am I so freaked out? What's going on here? It's because that's in there for us to notice and to shine the light of our consciousness on it so that we can dissolve it and dissipate it up and out and shine the light on the lie that, that we swallowed, that we contained when we were two or we were five or we were 12 or we were 25 or whatever the case may, may have been in our individual circumstances, once we decide that we are different or we are other or that there's something lacking or something missing or something broken, everything after that is an illusionary pain-filled life that we're either trying our best to outrun or cover over or suppress or put blinders on so that we don't experience the pain. And so the invitation is stop all the madness drop in, feel what you're feeling right now and let it be done. Let it be done once and for all. Let's just like breathe into it and, and accept it because you'll see that it's only energy. It's nothing. It's just energy that's been piled up and we assign meaning to those vibrations inside of us. And we write stories about it, worst case scenarios. And these images fly through our mind as if they're real and they might as well be, but they're not. And we could stop it once and for all. And I feel that this time is a perfect opportunity for humanity to be doing this at large. Mm. Well, it's so beautiful. That reminds me, I had a friend come over last night and um, she was telling me her back was so tight. Uh, she's getting all sorts of massage work done for it. And she said, you know, do you mind just to lay hands on me? And 
And I was happy to, because I've been doing a lot of exploring about just healing hands, letting bodies talk to me. And I put my hands on her and all I could hear was how much she wanted to be held, like how starved she was for, you know, just completely benign, but loving human connection. And so I started to work on her back and I asked her that question and she burst into tears. And then I had her turn over because I could feel her heart, you know, was just broken and disappointed. And so I did some work here and um, it was so much coming out of her emotionally. And I could, I could feel the body. I felt it was very positive. The body was saying to me, I just want to release this. I'm done. I'm complete. I'm ready to birth into something else. So I was sharing that with her and she said, but I don't know how. I said, oh, baby, you're doing it right now. This is the work. Just keep, you know, cry, yell, whatever you need to do. I'm right here. Zero judgment, total love. And it's so beautiful. You know, I got a text from her today. She's like a new human with all of that out of her now. And that's mm -hmm. all it took. Yes, there is a tremendous bonding that happens when, when we are opening to the energy field of another it takes us closer to the truth of who we are because the truth of it, Debbie, is we're not separate selves. We are one being that is appearing to be separate individuals. And it has to do with the compression of consciousness and how it is that we land here. Think of it like a big pane glass window that's tempered glass. If you put pressure on that glass, enough pressure, it's gonna shatter into a million tiny pieces but the pieces are still gonna stay connected to each other because there's a tiny film inside the glass window that keeps it from breaking off into these huge, big, dangerous shards. And so big plate glass windows now are made as tempered glass and that's what it means. So when you put pressure on it, it still is the window, but it looks like it's now a million tiny pieces. And that's what humanity is. If you understand how perception and consciousness and inside this, the, the, the mechanics of it all, the quantum field and what's happening inside of consciousness, we're compressing ourselves into this dimension that makes it look like we are shattered into a million tiny pieces. And so when we touch, when we bond, when we connect, even through conversation, even when we hold the, the intimacy of intention in our hearts and the imagery in our minds of another or of other, it opens the field to allowing that to be our reality again, rather than only perceiving ourselves as this separate individual. And so each level of that is extraordinarily healing, intentional and visualization, opening and holding and connecting with someone, being in reverie or in, in reverence or in devotional kind of love with other, being, as you say, in this benign state of of, of, of wonderful intention for humanity. When we tap in those vibrations, it automatically starts to merge us with other, other. And that other is really just the rest of who I am. So if we can go so far as to touch or to hug or to hold, and, and we certainly are missing that at this time, uh, you know, dramatically, but if we are able to go so far as to, is to bond it all the way to the physical dimension and not just mentally, emotionally, visually, intentionally, that kind of connection, but all the way to the physical realm, it literally, um, it's as if you're taking the pressure off the, the pane glass window and some of those little pieces are, they're bonding back together again, as if you could reverse the movie of it shattering. And, in that we have the experience then of a greater version of our wholeness because of that bonded connection and the overlaying of the energy fields. You know, we, we talk about, I have, I have all kinds of images that I'm always using when I'm teaching with people, uh, this energy field around the physical body. When you're working with another person and you come even close to each other, your fields overlap. If there's another person standing right here and there's another field and the fields are overlapping, um, this is the basic foundational uh, geometry that, that is called the Vesica Pisces. And it has to do with the, with the flower of life and the basic foundation of everything in the physical realm is compressed energy. And it, it's all energy that's vibrating and overlapping in its field. 
And when we start to overlap the matrix of you with the matrix of me, that bond in between is what is what literally sews us back together again. So we are feeling a greater version of our wholeness. We think that it's, oh my God, it's just so good that you gave me that hug. It's been so long since I've had a hug. Thank you so much. Um, and it's beautiful. And there's so much more to what's going on in that moment from, from a, 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 an energetic and physics standpoint, from a bioenergetic standpoint, there is a tremendous revelation happening energetically in that moment. And we're becoming more of the truth of, of, who, of, of who we are, which is why it feels so darn good. So um, just a little aside there that might've been of interest for folks that your energy field, the, the healthier you are and the more contained inside your own core and the more centered and grounded you are, the bigger your energy field gets. So you can be walking through the grocery store and even though people are keeping their distance from you, if you're aware that your energy fields are overlapping, you can actually have a loving exchange mm -hmm. with these people if you're aware of the space in between you and you animate it. If you live into that space and don't just, just um, retract and recede and isolate, if you remain open energetically, you will be nurtured at this time in a way that, that you won't be if you're you know, in, the, in the fear contraction mode. Open your energy field. And you do so not by opening it, but by grounding and anchoring and being in love and appreciation and, and uh, the, the wonder of life and the amazement of, oh my gosh, did you ever think we'd be experiencing things like this? Just being in that curiosity, that alone will allow your field to just naturally expand, especially if there's a heartfelt uh, reverence uh, associated with it. And you, you can have a, a beneficial healing presence on everyone that crosses your path and you end up at the end of the day feeling fulfilled in ways that are lacking in our lives right now. Oh, what a great reminder. It's so easy to forget that we are all fractals, right? Yes. And to, that everything seems so real, but from your reminder, we're truly all fractals. And the beautiful thing is when one heals, we all heal. The ripple just goes out. And that's uh, such also a lovely reminder that we don't have to actually do anything, but we can be something. And even in the beingness, we can change a grocery store, a phone call, uh, energy anywhere we go still in the state that the world is in. I think that's very powerful. And you talk about vibrational frequencies. And I know one of the things you talk about is vibrational signatures. And people might be curious, well, how do I determine that? How do I know what my vibrational signature is? What am I radio waving out there into the world? And how can I change that or harness it? Mm. So the way to access, identify, familiarize oneself with their soulful signature, their vibrational, their energetic signature is number one, to come home to yourself, to drop into what I reference as this teaching called subject, object, subject. And it means pull your energy onto yourself, not in a guarded kind of exclusive way or, um, or, or any kind of separative manner, but rather more like an accordion, you know, the, the, the instrument, the accordion, when the accordion folds up on itself, it doesn't ward anybody off, it just gathers. So we gather our energy back onto the self so that we can have a concentration of that energy running through our deep core. And when it runs through our deep central core channel in a concentrated fashion, we have the ability to start to feel and sense in a way we can't when we're too dispersed. So when someone walks in the room and you're, you're have, you have a tendency to throw your power onto them, like, oh my God, are they okay? Is this gonna be good? They don't look happy. I wonder what it's gonna do to me. If they're not happy, then I'm gonna stress and all that stuff. If you just like stop that, interrupt it, let it fall to the floor and then gather yourself right back onto you instead of dispersing it onto the news or the person or the story or the whatever, and just gather it back onto the self and allow this presence to be cultivated, to be magnified in the deep core center of your own being, 
Then you'll start to breathe in your belly. When you breathe in your belly, you start to activate the wisdom center below the navel. And you start to draw yourself down from living in your head to drawing more and more into the heart, into the throat, into the belly, and dropping into your personal power, and then dropping even deeper into your deep wisdom below the navel. And when you're starting to tap with high concentrations of energy and consciousness in that area of your body, there is a certain vibration that you will become. You will emanate it and radiate it. And it feels sort of like a sense of well being, a sense of having arrived after a long journey, mm. a sense of a victory that has truly embodied, it has occurred, and you're aware of it, and you've accepted it, and you're so grateful. A sense of coming home, a sense of um, presence and timelessness. Like I don't, I don't, I'm not under pressure to do this and do this and do this. This timelessness and spaciousness inside of our day or our breath. And when we're in that, there is a vibrational frequency that will start to surface to our awareness. And when that vibrational frequency surfaces to our awareness under those parameters, it will be a combination of energies that is the truth of who you are. It is as if the soul is rising and it is that exactly, actually. However, I'll say it like it is as if the soul is rising for those that might be listening that don't have any you know, relatability to such a statement of my soul rising. It isn't your soul rising. It is the soul rising and it is you. It is the real you. We think that we are a mind that has a soul when in reality, we are a soul that has a mind that's supposed to be serving it. And so when we find ourselves talking about spirit or talking about my soul, we are identified as the mind when we speak that way. Not so good. We're never going to have the access to this, this signature vibration as long as we are identified as the mind, the thinking, analytical, worrying mind, the deliberating mind, the predicting one, the planning one, the resentful one, the hurt one, the wounded one, all of that isn't the true self. And there are ways to merge that and meld it back together again, which is what I teach in my coursework. But in the meantime, it's very valuable to, real, to just go through this quantum flip in your mind that you are not a mind that has a spirit or a soul. You are a spirit or a soul that has a mind and has a body. And you're supposed to learn how to navigate those, work them together to, to navigate your life in the way that you're supposed to be able to navigate this life. And so we have to learn to do what we need to do for that to be the guiding uh, principle in our daily lives in order to find this signature vibration. But in the meantime, we can practice with those parameters that I was saying, it is as if there's timelessness and there's a victory that's been accomplished and a journey that you've come home from and, and you know, walking into your own bed, in your own home again, climbing into your own bed if you've been traveling too much. I, you know, I always say, I love bed and I really love my bed. It's so, you know, awesome. Those, the vibrations that are of the soulful self are similar. And the best way that I can describe it is a combination of some of those things collectively. So add them up and work with them and breathe with them and feel what that feels like inside your body. And now you're starting to get in the neighborhood of the vibrational frequency of your signature, um, your, signature your signature vibration. That is essential if we ever wanna be able to make decisions that are not fear-based, if we wanna be able to heal if we want to be able to start relationships and develop relationships and cultivate and then celebrate relationships with people that are based in authenticity and truth, that are reliable, that are lifetime friendships that will that you know that you can count on and that is, are the real deal, we have to establish and nurture those relationships and always speak into them from that vibration. Not from, oh my gosh, is this okay? Is this enough? Is this what you want? Am I delivering and all that? That fear-based stuff has to drop again to the floor and we have to then gather our energies back onto subject instead of giving them away to such ideas as inadequacy or insufficiency or, or other uh, inventions that we've come up with and allow a come from that is truly based in this um, creatorship instead of a reactive survivorship. One of your recent videos, Dr. C, you suggested that we take a time out 
and we check in and make sure we're doing what we really desire. And you mentioned it's really important that we ask ourselves, do I feel love inside of my body? Will you go more in depth about generating the love, opening our heart, breathing to connect and finding out what it is we do truly desire so we're sure that we're aligning to create that? Yes, that was there a question associated with that? Yeah, so just to go more in depth. So for people who didn't see the video like I did, but I also, you you mentioned it um, in yeah. one of your recent videos, the time out, like, are, am I doing what I desire? Is there love in my body? And I'm just curious with all the, well, I'm actually, I guess, asking you for a practice. How can we do that? Because I think, I think a lot of happiness, joy, self-love, other love, purpose, you know, things that people really desire and want to generate is connected with that, doing what we desire, knowing, being that connected with ourselves to even know what that is, and then knowing how to align with that to make it happen. Sure. You know, there's a time in my life when I, I was just being a good soldier. I just grew up in a certain environment and had certain ways of living being modeled for me. Fortunately, they were, they, it was a model of service mm -hmm. and of, of great competency with healing and being a healer and, and being in this conversation of quantum science and epigenetics and bioenergetics, et cetera. And, and so while it was a very expansive reality that I grew up in, I also was growing up in it just like everybody else grew up in their environment and started modeling and absorbing those, those aspects of our upbringing in our environment. And then we just show up and do what we think we're supposed to do to make things work. Well, that was me too. Even though it was in a world where I was helping other people and things were happening, it was amazing because I could help other people. But when it came to helping myself, I was clueless. I did not know how to do that any more than somebody who grew up under a totally different set of circumstances and had different things modeled to them and lived their life and became that absorbed into that modeling is the same. We all have to learn, oh, this applies to me. Oh, okay, how do I do that? And, and that was what I turned my life into this living laboratory after I had this great awakening that occurred 20 years ago that I've spoken about uh, in your shows before that, that I realized that I had to come home to myself. I had to bring my consciousness into my heart, into my core, into my gut, and to land in here with all of my awareness, not think about it, but go in there and feel in order to ever be able to know whether I was doing what I really wanted to be doing or not. The first time someone asked me, what would you be doing in your life if you could do anything you wanted to do, uh, and you didn't have to figure out how to have it happen, what would that be? Hmm. I was stymied. I, I literally did not know what to say. And I said, I don't know. And tears started to come down my face because I, I, in that moment, realized I've actually never let myself dream about my dream. Mm -hmm. I've been walking into what was modeled for me and being very good at replicating that but I don't even know if it's what I would be doing, if I could be doing anything I wanted to do. And so I said to the, the gentleman I was on the phone with, I said, I, I don't, I don't know. Tears coming down my face. And he said something that set me free in that moment. He said, well, what would you say if you did know? And I said, oh, well, if I did know what I would be doing in this moment, I, because now the pressure was off, right? I was just making it up. I said, I would be teaching, you know, here I was, I was a doctor and owning a clinic, having other doctors work for me, having a staff that depended on me, having patients that I was treating every day that were dearly depending on me. And boom, that was my life all day, every day. And here is this question, you know, boom. So I said, well, if I'm just making it up, if I did know, I would say I'd be teaching meditation retreats and self-healing retreats in beautiful beachfront destinations all around the world. And I just kind of laughed after that, like, that ain't going to happen. And, and he said, write that down. And I was like, sure. And he said, no, seriously, write it down. So I opened my drawer and I pulled out a notebook and I wrote it down, teaching beautiful, you know, uh, or teaching uh, meditation. I wasn't into yoga at the time yet. Meditation and self-healing retreats at beautiful beachfront, you know, destinations. I wrote it down. And at the end of our phone call, um, 
I closed the book and put it back in the drawer, shut the drawer and went on back down the hall to treat patients again. And um, a few years later, I was moving my office to a new location. And so I was cleaning out my desk and I opened the drawer and was pulling things out. And I was like, what's this? Opened it up and it opened to that page. And I read it and I sat down on my chair, um, just my mouth draping open. Because two days later, I was leaving for Cancun to teach the very first meditation and self-healing retreat on this beautiful beachfront destination in Mexico. And uh, what I realized was that when we allow ourselves to use our imagination, because I was just using my imagination, it's like, okay, I'm just going to make it up. Uh, what comes out of us is what's trying to come out of us all the time, but we contain it and we, and we keep it squelched inside of the world that we think we're supposed to be living in. So as a practice, number one, I would say, you have to make it up. You have to use your imagination and ask the question. If you didn't have any idea how it was going to happen, uh, what would be happening if you could have it any way that you wanted? And when you don't know, just say to yourself, if there's nobody there to say it for you, uh, okay, well, what would I think if I did know? What would I say if I did know? And watch what happens. It literally opens another doorway. A different set of circuits now come onto the scene. And by practicing this loving pause, this coming home to the self, coming onto subject and breathing in our bellies and allowing our hearts to flourish inside of this deep core presence that we are creating for the self, that what will happen in that moment is we will be able to sense and feel a vibration inside of us, an energy, a presence. And inside of that, it will be like nurturing love that is here. It will be like grandma. It will be like mother. It will be like the mother. If your mother's, if your relationship with your mother wasn't delightful, uh, think of it as mother nature. Think of it as being held. And when you're in that vibration and that state, what is true flourishes and rises and, and feels nurtured and begins to come up. And I would strongly encourage that you breathe in your belly, not in your upper lobes of your lungs, and that you specifically cause breathing in the belly to be enhanced and magnified and exaggerated. And if you can breathe in the belly in this exaggerated way, and then start to inhale from overhead and breathe into your belly and let the belly be big, but you're drawing this breath as if it's coming through the, a blowhole, like in the top of a whale's head or a dolphin, and it's coming down through the center of your brain and through your throat and to your heart, into your belly, and your belly is big and it's just this big kettle of wisdom. And then you exhale and squeeze it back and let it drop down into the earth and, and on the exhale. And then on the inhale, you draw it up from the earth into your belly and you again, let it be this cauldron of wisdom and nurturing presence. And then you squeeze it back in and exhale up through your heart and through your throat, through the center of your brain and at the top of your head. What you begin to do is cultivate a combination of energies that will allow you to sense and feel this, this pause. It's this quantum and divine pause that all of humanity is being asked to do right now. That's actually what, what is before us. And if we are open to receiving this, this gift of the way things go, um, we will find ourselves inside this state in this way that is this beautiful combination of energies that allows the contemplation of what would it be if it could be anything what would I be doing? What service would I be giving? How would I be contributing to humanity? What, what would I be receiving? What would I be feeling? What would I be accepting for myself as possible and true? One of the greatest things that I do is constantly embrace how amazing my life has become. Mm -hmm. I'm constantly amazed at how expansive it has become and how glorious it is to spend my time in service to humanity and how humanity's response to what I am sharing has evolved. Mainly when I think about it from terms of growing up sleeping on the floor of my closet because I was so intimidated about life, I was just freaked out and being so painfully shy that I would never engage with people and then trying to push through that and overcome it in junior high and high school and coming out into the world, all on that push pedal to the metal to overcome the fear that I was experiencing. And 
uh, struggling through perfectionism to try to be good enough or to do it right. And, and to be able to lay that down and breathe this amazing presence with the self and know that there's a connection here that nothing can destroy, that nothing will ever take away, that nothing ever can have. It is the connection that Viktor Frankl wrote about when he was released from prison after years of being in prison for a crime that he didn't commit. And he came out of prison and turned around and thanked his captors because of what he discovered about himself under their uh, guarded Ship, you know, their guardianship in a very different way. Yeah. It changed <laughs> the Holocaust way. survivor you're referring to. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Being, being, being chained to a radiator for years, re recognizing that as, as each privilege was taken away, um, he realized that there was something that could not be taken. Hmm. It, it just couldn't have it. it. It just, no matter what they did. He found, he found this place, he found it. And when we find this place that is immovable and unwavering and absolute, it, we know it. And life can continue to cause enough pain that will drive us inward. But if we know how to navigate that, it doesn't have to be painful and we can go inwardly uh, intentionally and it's actually quite joyful. And then what is discovered when we land there is this place that, that we're talking about, that within which it is very easy to define if I am doing or to decide if I am doing what I am here to do, if I am living my life the way I'm here to live it. It doesn't mean what you do as a vocation. It means what do I do with my mind every day? How do I use it? What do I do with my heart in relationship to my mind? And what do I do with my breath in relationship to my heart and my mind? And therefore, is the byproduct and the story that I'm living inside of, is it what I want to be living in? Is it the way I want to feel? Is there love in my body? Is this love flowing and flourishing and is healing happening? Or am I duping myself in some way by just continuing to believe that if my mind is a worrying mind, that it has the right to sabotage my life experience? And it doesn't. I'm here to train my mind. I have to train my mind. And you know, this saying of the, the beatings will continue until morale improves <laughs> comes to mind. Yeah. It's like, you can't beat up your mind enough to make it want to serve love. It's not, yeah. it's gonna become defensive and abused and you know, abrasive and eventually it's gonna fight back. And so you just have to love your mind's tendency to worry. Mm. Love, its, uh, love its tendency. Love its tendency to believe in the idea that someone said something to you when you were in elementary school that is having an effect on you. Love your mind for biting into that and believing it all these years. And when you begin to love it compassionately, it starts to let go of those things that it bit into, that it's been holding on to as some form of identity that has been causing so much pain. We just mm. don't have to live in that kind of pain. So powerful. Yeah, it reminds me of when I was an actress, I learned early on, I didn't always have nerves, but the times I did, especially in opening night, I learned to talk to my body before I would go on stage and just say, oh, knees, you're knocking, you're really afraid. Oh, body, oh, hands, you're shaking. Whatever was happening as a symptom of what I, the excitement really, um, the trepidation that I was feeling, but it was just coming out through my body, and I knew walking on stage was not gonna serve me to be in that condition. So I would literally acknowledge the body for exactly what it was doing and being. And it's so beautiful how it transmuted immediately. And I started doing that at one point, I was, I was fairly young, but I suddenly thought about, there's a passage in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was not an alcoholic, but I found the book amazing. And it said, um, you know, the answers to all our problems are in our connection, our, our compassion, much what you're saying, or acceptance of exactly them as they are. And I knew that it meant basically an addiction, you know, to accept that we have this condition. But what I took it to mean was our emotions, that we were so busy pushing away and resisting that we actually uh, solidified them. And I realized, oh, 
So instead of me being angry and then pushing away my anger, which meant that I stayed in anger, what if I just sat here and acknowledged my anger and acknowledged the rightness of the anger and the point of view of the anger? And I just did it as an exercise. What I didn't realize is the byproduct and the genius of, of sitting and doing something like that with anything is it was gone. I didn't even have anger anymore. And I found that to be an incredible practice to just be present with what was and then see it alter. It was never my intention to see it alter, but boy, did that yeah. teach me a lot. Yeah. You know, our true nature is awareness. That's all we are. We are just pure awareness. We are energy that's awake. That's it. We are energy that can observe things. That's our true nature. So when we have developed a story uh, about something, then we have resistance to anything that is unlike our story. And if we are forced outside of our comfort zone, we get afraid or we get angry or we get hurt or we get uh, defensive. And all of that is energy just, just folding over on itself and creating a drama for us to be living inside of. And if you unpack that, we come back to just pure awareness. And so when you shine your awareness on any emotional reaction that you're having to that folded over illusionary false self and the story that we're in, if you shine your awareness onto it, it starts to unpack it and disassemble it. And so by being present with the anger, it dissolves the anger because you're shining your light on the illusion of the whole story all together. And you start to set yourself free by just allowing your awareness to fall upon anything that is causing discomfort or to fall upon anything that brings up great joy. That when we put, when we're aware of being aware, when we're aware that we're noticing it, when we're noticing it and we're specifically saying, I see you kind of thing, what happens is it unpacks, it, it shoots us into an entirely different dimension of ourselves. And suddenly we are liberating the mind. We're noticing what story it's telling itself. Because if we are angry or if we are hurt or if we are in pain, there's a story involved, I guarantee it. Because if we were just purely aware of everything as it unfolds, we would never have to draw a conclusion. We would never have to be um, <laughs> defending something. We would be free. So what you're describing is how we set ourselves free is just witness what you're feeling and give it permission to be. Because when you give it permission to exist, it now doesn't have a hold of you, rather you have a hold of it. And now it will have a different role in your life and your life will have an entirely different um, experience and outcome for sure. Oh, it's beautiful. You know, uh, first of all, it's really nice to see you in other clothes. I'm used to seeing you in your yoga outfit because <laughs> I'm part of your yoga body awake yoga membership, which I really uh, love. Yes. Oh. oh, wonderful. And yeah. in one of your yoga classes, speaking about retreats, this started with you talking about um, you fulfilling your heart's desire and you found your desire was really to be delivering these retreats in these beautiful places. So we got to see pictures of you at Easter Island. That was so special. And you've led retreats there. And I hope I'm going to say this right. The Moai people, is that how you say oh, it? Uh -huh. Moai. Uh -huh. Yeah. I'm a little obsessed with them right now. And you mentioned the Moai people and that they had primal instincts mm -hmm. and connected those instincts to today and our primal foundation into higher frequencies. I was pretty fascinated by that. Can you share about the Moai people and how it intersects with humanity today and what the, I don't know, what's germane there for us? What's the grist? Sure. So, so the Moai were a peoples that were completely focused on bringing consciousness here. And they were not from this planet, is that correct, originally? Correct. Okay. So they're descendants from another dimension. They come in, they are bringing a higher state of consciousness here. 
and seeding the planet with it. Hmm. And this happened all over the planet, but on this in this particular area of the world, um, off the eastern coast of South America, is this this Easter Island. Um, so so in this particular area, these peoples were landing as just as primitively as you can imagine, but completely peaceful, mm -hmm. completely here, descending upon the planet and holding a grounded anchoring presence. Almost if you could imagine in some uh, special effects movie that we could watch today, if the earth could just morph up into a person and the person would walk as this is this deeply um, stout, big, uh, big holding big consciousness in their body kind of individual. Like if the earth was up and walking, and we've certainly seen things like that in, in our special effects movies that are uh, available to us these days. And, uh, and just imagine that, that they were so earthly and so grounded in their presence that it was almost emerging with the elements that was occurring. You know, we talk about in, in spiritual terms, which, which I don't get asked these kinds of questions in my interviews very as, as often. It's usually about quantum science and epigenetics and bioenergetics, but mm -hmm. I had this huge opening and spiritually, and I can, you know, I could see energy and as, a, as I could as a kid, but I shut it down as a kid because it didn't fit in and it was making me say strange things that people couldn't relate to. So I shut it down and then it came back when I had this big awakening 20 years ago. And so it's there. I don't know how to not see it, but there it is. And, uh, and one of the things that, that I saw and see in these sacred sites where I go um, is the different aspects of consciousness that are represented in the sacred sites around the world. So Easter Island, sacred site, Moai peoples holding a state of consciousness that is deeply peacefully grounded deeply and peacefully grounded. And so they're oftentimes seen the statues with this block on their head. And it is literally a form of the consciousness that was so primal that it just, it, it looked to be seated as, as the crown chakra in this blocked kind of way. That it was just this big, as if it was a big heavy stone. Now, on the other side of the planet, Shortly thereafter, there were headdresses and stones on, on, on heads of gods and goddesses or, or peoples that were ascended in their thoughts in Greece and in England and in Egypt, uh, just to name a few, that over time became more and more ornate and the block would have multiple layers to it, like a stair step in some and it was depicting the development, the further development of consciousness and being able to perceive multiple dimensions. And so the relevancy for us to talk about these things in a, in a today now moment is that inside of each one of us, inside of our own DNA, research is showing us that our D DNA is actually a fusion of multiple different species now this research isn't you know, widely spoken about in, in the mass consciousness, but it is definitely um, documented inside of research projects from, from well-respected scientists in the genome project of what our heritage is and what our lineage is and where we come from and what we're made of. And so um, it, is, it is inside of that that it becomes relevant when we're starting to recognize through epigenetics that we can turn on and turn off our genetic coding at will by the environment that we create through the thoughts that we think and the vibration that we hold and the amount of love that we are allowing to flow through our system. It activates and opens doorways and turns on telomeres inside of our DNA uh, helix and allows us to access aspects of our lineage that sit dormant until they don't. And they don't sit dormant when we begin to activate them, not just with our free will mind, but with our choice of environment that we're allowing to flow through our body. So in a simple conversation in a video where I say, are you allowing love to flow through your body? 
all of this kind of information is behind the scenes when I'm asking a simple question like that, because I know if an individual will allow love to flow through their body, it will activate their, their lineage, their, their inheritance, what is in their DNA that has been sitting dormant for thousands and thousands of years. And if and when we are ready to activate that, it will become activated and we will ascend in our consciousness from being a third dimensional being to being a fourth or a fifth dimensional being to being able to access also ancient e Egypt has written in their history books that they solicited a fourth and fifth dimensional civilization called the Hathors that would bring the vibrational frequency of love into the experimentation that was happening in ancient Egypt because we needed help in tethering our minds. Our minds were blowing things up. It was so powerful. So we had to, we had to learn how to, how to filter it and how to modify the, the power of the mind. And it was love that allowed that dampening and that softening and that buffering of the mind field. It's love that is a solution. And this frequency, again, inside of the experimentation of the development of a species and one that could become self-conscious, self-aware that was happening in ancient Egypt. So there's a direct correlation between what was happening in Easter Island, what was happening in ancient Egypt, what was happening in India, what was happening in Greek mythology, all at the same time. Now, these are things that were, were being cultivated and it's inside of us, it's what we're made of. And if we allow ourselves to unattach from the busy treadmill that we were on and benefit from what life is asking of us right now, sit down, get to know yourself better, breathe into your own true self and see what surfaces. You will become so inspired that it will more than allow you to choose your next project or to dampen the anxiety that is in your life and to turn it into some powerful energy that you can utilize it will do more than that. It will allow you to start remembering who you really are and what you're made of. And when we start to know that and own it, we become a truly beneficial presence on the planet because we don't take this drama for anything other than what it is intended to be, which is simply a polish, a stone to polish ourselves against. The drama is here for us to reflect back and to recognize I am not that. I can choose to transcend this and utilize this moment for something good rather than deciding that I just need to be afraid right now because everybody else is being afraid. There's something more in store for you. And some of us will choose to take that challenge and to awaken inside of all this. And it's my hope that it's everyone that's uh, joining us here today. Oops, I can't hear you. Snap is what I said. This is a time for us. It's like a stone for us to polish ourselves against. Do not make the drama, the, the illusion so real. Wow. Um, powerful. And just finally, what happened to the Moai people? Did, where did they go? Were they complete and they went back to the, yeah, it, the it galaxy? That, that it was just an ascension. It was a dissension for a project and then, and then a return, an ascension back into uh, higher realms. Now, you know, this is gonna sound a little crazy, but I'm guessing that, you know, peeps can handle this. Um, I, I see the energies and when I'm there, I see them there. Hmm. They're there, it's just that we are operating in such a manner that we dial into a different frequency. We can see the statues mm -hmm. and we can relate to them that way. Mm -hmm. But between the statues and in front of the statues and around the statue is the energy of the Moai. They are there in the other dimension as well. Mm -hmm. So the statue is here so that we can direct our conscious mind onto an object that is the geometry and the geometrical representation of them and what they hold as true. But while our conscious mind is tending to that project of the physical dimension, uh, that statue, our superconscious is interacting with them. And perhaps it is only at a subconscious level if we're unable to perceive it, but it is there, they are there, they are here. And it isn't just the Moai, it is the deities of all of the dimensions that have been, you know, are considered in history, uh, whether it's 
the gods and the goddesses of Hinduism or Greek mythology, what is happening is the consciousness is, it is. The, the fourth dimension is here. It's just, can we dial into it? Can we perceive it or not? The fifth dimension is here, but can we perceive that? And so what I'm teaching people is how to build the circuitry to perceive more and more and more refined energy. And that refined energy is fourth and fifth and multi-dimensional energies that also I can speak about it like, well, you can handle your stress better. Well, you're going to sleep better. You're going to be more inspired in life. And that's how I usually have to talk about it. Yeah. But yeah. what I'm really saying in between the lines and the bubble over my head is it's all right here. All you have to do is learn how to access this. And the way to access it is ironically by finding that deep place, that deep core place within us that is the knower, that is the love, that is this flowing uh, presence that allows us to, to address, am I, am I really doing with my faculties what I want to be doing with them while I'm here on this planet? Will I leave this planet feeling fulfilled that I awakened to everything that I came here to awaken to? And will I have lived my life in that knowing versus just discovering it in the last five minutes when I finally let, set my mind free and become fully wholly present with myself here? I'd love for it to be sooner rather than later so that we are enjoying our life here in the grand adventure that it is intended to be. Um, but that's everyone's choice. Indeed. And what are you offering right now? People who are listening, watching, um, want to connect with you further outside of drsuemorder.com. What else is possible? Uh, there are a variety of things that people can join in to, um, to work with us in all kinds of ways. There is the Body Awake Yoga class that you, um, that you mentioned uh, that you have been a part of and something that I dearly love. I, um, I, I highly recommend that people get engaged in that. There are many things on the website that you can go to just by joining in on the website. There are free gifts that are available to you in the forms of meditations and, and a copy of a master class that is uh, available. Um, that is a, a, a moment, a, it's an hour long um, talk where we, uh, people ask different questions and I answer all the questions together at the same time so that uh, they can uh, see that all of our questions are related to one another and that as such, um, we are bonded. And so I weave together all the answers to these questions so that people see that they're not alone. And, and it's, it's quite fascinating how it happens. I draw little images relative to the questions that they're asking. And then I show people how everything is fit together and that everything affects everything else. Uh, there is an, a, a meditation that is called Activating the Healer Within, that is the free gift that I'm bringing specifically to uh, this conversation. And it is um, a great joy to do that because that healer within is the one that we've been talking about this entire time. And that, that healer within is the true self. It is really you. You don't have a healer on the inside of you. Once you go in there, you will recognize that that, that, that that is you, that is the true self. Something else that I would also love to offer everyone is, um, is a healing transmission that I offer for free every month. Join us in the monthly healing uh, transmission. Let me see if there's a, a, a link for that. Um, yes, monthly healing, or drsuemorder.com slash monthly uh, healing transmission. Um, and uh, inside of that, people will be able to receive with, with no special training. They can absolutely just um, sit back and receive. Sit back and have it, have it happen for you. Yeah. Well, thank you for another sumptuous conversation that only brings up more questions and curiosity <laughs> for me. So always, always, always a pleasure to mm -hmm. catch up and hang out with you. Absolutely. And uh, we'll just have to get together again and answer those questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I look forward to it. Thank you, Dr. Sue. Debbie, thank you, my dear. Yeah. Thank you for what you're doing in the world. And I end today's show with this quote from TV host Fred Rogers. 
no matter where they are, either here or in heaven. Imagine how pleased those people must be to know that you thought of them right now. Remember to subscribe to the Dare to Dream podcast. And if you're listening to the audio version and you'd like to see me and the guest, I recommend you do go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger for this weekly number one transformation conversation. Next week, my upcoming guest is Lisa Royal Holt. I just returned from her contact in the desert workshop. That was uh, mind blowing. Some of the things that happened, we'll discuss. She's a well-known channel and an author of the books, Preparing for Contact and much more. And she's been a trans channel. You've seen her a lot on Gaia TV. Um, I'm very excited to finally sit down in conversation with this remarkable woman. Thank you for joining us. And thank you all for the dreams you're willing to go after and what you're willing to be in the world at this very important time.